Um, and there, we think there are some Dune parallels here with the Tron deck. Are you are you fam- are you a a Dune man? I have um, two copies of Dune that I've never read. Either. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my take on this. Um, I've gotten. My take here is, uh, you know, if you haven't if you haven't read Dune or have not seen the David Lynch movie, which, in my opinion, is one of the best movies ever made. Um, which is like you're the only one with that take. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel it's like extremely I controversial. I know. Uh, it's just it's you know it it just makes. I mean, Star Wars is a kids movie, but it really makes Star Wars look like a kids movie. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> But oh my god, hold on, Lucas, your your video keeps resizing. Let's get you. Let's get you right. Um. So okay, the the deck we're about to play is like the villain deck in in Magic. It's like if you're playing it, you know, I probably hate you, and I hate myself <laughs> for playing it. But I feel like part of this part of the show is not giving a fuck how the games go. So uh, we're going to play probably, uh, probably my most hated magic deck um, of all time. And it has nothing it's to do with you. It's, it's all about, so like the Dune thing, I guess we were talking about, you know, there's, there's this card right here, Worm Coil Engine. You know, the mm. worm is the spice, spice is the worm. It's sure. it's like the you know the planet Dune the the Arrakis the planet, Arrakis Arrakis yeah the planet of Dune is protected by these giant worms and um and then there's this other oh this deck isn't even playing Karn what a what a disappointment <laughs> but most of them play this play this this guy um, Karn who's like kind of like the villain he's like the Baron Baron Harkonnen of of the magic uh-huh. universe. So I've Cole gotten through like so convinced four... that you'd have read Dune. <laughs> I've well, I've gotten through about four hours of the audiobook. I've tried it in every format. I love it. I love what I was. I love what I was hearing. But um, <laughs> I just, it's, it's a big I have book. To read, like, yeah, I have to read hear... like ten books at a time, and I keep slipping out of Dune. I heard it's got this got kind of like a steep, you know, entry. Like mm. the the beginning is really kind of tough to get through, and then once you're past that, you're kind of cruising. Um, um, it's 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 what's his name Herbert Frank Herbert. Yeah, yeah. He writes really really beautifully. I just um, I kept getting distracted doing other things and reading shorter books. Have but, you ever seen? There's a there's a great documentary, uh, J- Jodorowsky's Dune. Oh about, yeah, yeah. Uh, a guy who tried to make Dune and kind of failed. Um, yeah, with uh, with Mobius. A lot of Mobius uh-huh. draws. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, yeah, totally. I mean, I, I really wanted to uh, to finish it because I thought that um, it was going to have that HBO Max release. So I mm-hmm. wanted to try to read Dune before, and I failed. But then, you know, the movie got pushed back, so I have another year to finish Dune. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what's your what's your experience with Magic the Gathering been thus far? Like, are you familiar with the game? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. So I, I think last year a friend, a, a group of friends, um, and I kind of got into it. And, and one of my friends, Max, he was like a huge uh, Magic the Gathering guy growing up. So we just had some really preliminary flirtations with it but um the beginning of quarantine i got really obsessed with arena magic the gathering arena um yeah, yeah. i'm really bad at it but somehow i might be the best of all time <laughs> <laughs> i had some i had the i was just using the stock out for blood deck and um swapped it with a few things but i just opened my arena and it seems like 16 of my cards are banned so <laughs> I'm, I'm never gonna play again. Um, but yeah, Just it's like the swap best it for some other stock deck. You know, I know, I know. I really like the my um, I lean on the really fast fast decks, really fast attacks. This this the deck aggro, right now though. is the opposite of that. Yeah, it's really not a Dijon deck, but <laughs> it's the just only the thing that's kind of Dijon. Yeah, that's the only thing we really kind of is the worm. All. Yeah, the only um, thing about it is the words. Yeah. Brian says he's dune pilled in chat. Um what are your what are what are like the big sci-fi things for you, Dijon? Oh, um I'm like a really 
I mean, I'm a pretty like me thing. Yeah, I'm a pretty like. I don't know if I'm like the the, you know, the deepest authority all the time. But I I was really into like Ursula Le Guin, Left Hand me of Darkness. Me too. Um, yes. Yeah, Luca, that's like Lucas my, bought me uh, the Dispossessed for my birthday. Yeah, no, I, I've I've read the Dispossessed, but that was a while ago. Um, but I was just like I think kind of like everybody, I was really into Philip Dick. Um, mm-hmm initially and that's kind of what opened the doors but my favorite sci-fi thing i've ever read is dahlgren by samuel delaney um have you heard of this Mm -mm. really gigantic tome of a book that's this it's this um it's really only only kind of like sci-fi adjacent but it's this crazy fever dream of a book that is written in in a big circle it's like the whole nature of it is is quite circular and it's about an abandoned unnamed um city somewhere in the near future the assumption is that there was some sort of like nuclear cataclysm and it's just the people living in the city and it's sort of this uh um it's like the mix of everything i really like it's got some pretty heady ideas but also just people hanging out in a city we're like dahlgren yeah dahlgren yeah d-h-a-l-g-r-e-n that's like that was my favorite um sci-fi stuff Samuel Delaney writes really well um and other stuff too I mean I've just been right now I was reading um Ubik Ubik by Philip K. Dick um I don't know that I'm in the middle of that um but yeah I I, that's just kind of I just kind of jump all over the place with sci-fi like I did the Ted Chiang short stories and stuff he's the one who wrote Arrival Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. stuff like that um but yeah, I'd say the Left Hand of Darkness and Dahlgren are like the two big staples for me. Um, I, I I just finished Solaris. Have you heard Stanislaw Lem? Sure, it's a great one. Yeah, no, my friend was just recommending that. Um, it was in her little library. Uh, I've always so, wanted. I, I couldn't so good. couldn't get through the movie. Oh, the movies are <laughs> terrible. The movies like are it. awful. Don't don't watch the movies. <laughs> and I love Tarkovsky movies, yeah. but. But, but the I don't think either of them are very are very good. I had this um, this recurring thing where I would get I think forty eight minutes into it and fall asleep every time. Ever the Tarkovsky time. one or the yeah, Soderbergh the, one? No, yeah. the Tarkovsky one. Every yeah. time. It's but, uh, really strange. It doesn't. You can't. It's such a visual thing. I mean, to to really adapt the book, it would be like a James Cameron movie budget. Like it's it's, <laughs> it's not an action book or anything, but. It's so insane visually that I don't think you could really ever do it, um, yeah. do it justice as a movie. Well, um, um, yeah. You, so you just put out a single that is like, th- there's a million people on this this yeah. single, um, and um, you've you've been kind of like going through uh, the band phase. Am mm-hmm. I right? Or just mm-hmm. like revisiting the band. Yeah. Um, and I, I felt like you posted some, some, some like last waltz posts. And then this, this song that was just like a feature of everyone. Um, yeah. And it felt kind of, kind of like, uh, like sort of a nod there. Um, would you say that's accurate? Well, you know, what's really funny about that is we had done this idea for that song. Um, probably like almost a year ago. And mm, okay. I will say I'd never heard the band before. And um, I was on my way up to upstate New York a few months ago to do some recording. And, you know, for some reason, I just always glossed over the band. I just never, you know, I'd heard about Dylan going electric. I had no idea they were involved. Um, and this is there there's a point to this whole thing just so, so but um so a friend was just like oh you know like you know listen to the night they drove old dixie down or something and i mm-hmm. heard it and was so obsessed it was like probably the first time since i was maybe in college or something that i was just so feverishly obsessed with something suddenly mm-hmm. i like ran through everything all the interviews i could find um as many records as I could. I mean, I'd say towards the later period, they they, they were a little shaky. But, um, you know, I was really obsessed with this idea of 
them as this like gigantic unit thing and bringing it back to Stranger, we just weren't going to release the Stranger. I mean, I loved everybody's mm-hmm. contributions and was super grateful. But after hearing the band, there was definitely a moment where it was like the sort of joyous looseness of their music definitely was a nice it was like a definite subconscious motivator to be like we should just put it out um Mm -hmm. and i had a lot of people a couple of friends were like yeah that's you know it wasn't the first time the parallel came up so i just kind of thought that it was this weird cosmic thing i don't know i I never heard of them and i just so quickly fell in love with the process and the approach um it became very uh i felt very attached to it kindred spirits type flow so oh, totally yeah yeah but it when was kind you of started act- when you started posting about it because i know you a little bit and i know that you're you have these kind of um these these bands will pop up that 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 you just kind of missed or whatever it is you know i'm i'm the same way and then you'll just have this this phase with them i feel like um yeah and when he started posting about it, I'm like, oh, Dijon found the band. <laughs> and he's, he's vibing over there. Um, oh, I'm like still deeply obsessed. And it's it's like, yeah, it's spilled into a lot of the way I'm trying to work, you know. Um, yeah. Totally. I and mean, Levon Helms, one of the greatest drummers of all time and, and singers cool. at the same time. And one of the worst drum teachers. Have you ever watched a YouTube video of him I'm trying to explain how he plays drums? Uh-uh. One of the most <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it's one of the most incoherent. <laughs> it's it's one of the craziest. He's super I've old, ever like with the gloves on and stuff. Yes. Yeah, and he goes like, yeah. uh, "So what I like to do is I like to put a little. Uh, I, I play the 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 sock symbol, and it's like no one knows what that is. That's not a, <laughs> that's not a thing. And then he just starts playing, and he's like. So then I just hit it like a one and a two, and then I put a three on there. And it's just one of the least, <laughs> the least helpful. But I became a better drummer by looking at it somehow. So, yeah. Yeah. He's it's such a crazy voice. Insane yeah. voice. What's up with that? What's up with, you know, you have, I get kind of all up in arms when people are like, well, you've never listened to this? Because it's like, I don't know. I, people come across things when they do and, sure. and have their own relationships with stuff. But, I feel that you have sort of a unique entry to music and a unique, um, there are, there are you know, the things that sort of end up grabbing you and being really important to you are things that a lot of people take for granted a lot of the time. Um, so, so like what, how, do, how does that happen? How did that happen for you? Yeah. yeah I mean, growing up, it was strictly uh, rap. And R&B, that was it. Um, I was talking to a, you know, a friend where the, the first memory I have is a P Diddy, the "I'll Be Missing You" video. Mm-hmm. The first thing I ever remember, like really watching when he falls off the bike. Um, mm-hmm. So I just, and my family's, you know, they uh, both sides because I, I had to move back and forth with my parents all the time. They just weren't really musical. They didn't necessarily. Um, obsess over music or anything like that so it all started with just like rap music and then you know cousins or whatever would just give me hand me down cds and then um i found out about like file sharing and you know i i thought that i sort of hit you know by the time i was like 14 or 15 it's a naive thought but i kind of thought that i hit the furthest reaches of of rap and hip-hop <laughs> I like I I was so voracious in like stealing this music that I had like gotten all the way to you know once you start getting into like dose one and so you know like atmosphere I was like okay I think I hit the end of like what I've heard in rap so I had friends growing up you know back in Maryland who were always the opposite it was just guitar based music or like rock music and I just got snatches of things like Block Party and Sufjan Stevens through them and. Mm-hmm. For me, it was always like when I got into like when I was like growing up listening to R&B, there's a specific feeling that I always mm-hmm. had that I would always let dictate which songs I liked and didn't like. And I started to hear just a, a lot of the same parallels um, with like, you know, when I heard The Predatory Wasp by Sufjan on, on Come On Fill the Illinois or whatever it's called. Um, it felt the same way to me as like when I had first heard 
D'Angelo or whatever. So, Mm -hmm. but, you know, through late high school and college, I just kind of had to, you know, I'd go to record stores or whatever and just go to the bargain bin and just, you know, pull out stuff that I thought was kind of cool. And, you know, I could sample it and I'd listen to Simon and Garfunkel that way. Like I had no, um, there was no like direction. Nobody really had a lot of deep influence on my later life because I just kind of found stuff on the internet and then found blogs and um, like music journalism. And it just kind of all stemmed from there. You know, the I really thought about MF Doom because he passed RRP to MF Doom. Mm-hmm. And now he was like, to me, the actual split point because um, when I got obsessed with him, it sort of introduced me to like different magazines that would cover him, you know. Um, and through those magazines, you'd also see like another record they reviewed. So it was like an extremely linear process for me. Um, but that's how I miss stuff like the band is because, you know, I got into the Beatles and then, you know, Bob Dylan in a different way. But it was always this like sort of pick and choose kind of situation. I was missing a ton of stuff. I'm still just discovering like um, all sorts of things. That's kind all of the, the great thing about music is like no matter how deep you go, you can just like always go deeper. Mm-hmm. You know, um, there's just like for one artist can lead you into like 50 others. And it's just kind of this endless process of discovery. Like there's nobody's ever listened to um, like even a fraction of all the music on earth. Yeah. And it's funny with like the internet too, because you can, um, like it's just so disjointed in terms of, I think, you know, uh, the access point. So when I was in high school, I was making beats or whatever, but then I found out about grouper through like a random blog. And so it's like, I skipped so much of like <laughs> folk music and just went straight to grouper. And like, I was like, well, this is the best music of all time. And then just gradually retroactively, you start hearing things that sort of may have shaped it or influenced it. Um, but that's just like way later, you know, you, you start to pick up on, um, oh, you know, this kind of sounds like that. And it's just interesting with the internet too. It's like, it's, it's, yeah, there's no, the, the time frame is so disjointed in a, in, a, in a really cool way. I was like super deep in Animal Collective and, and like, you know, uh, Woods. He has a, Woods that they had like a crazy record. But I had missed so much of like um, any other, you know, there's so many other little bands and stuff like that, that that I just didn't get a chance to get into. But it's, yeah, it's so exciting every time you do it. And the band for me was like, really reinvigorated my my love of not just music stuff but discovering music stuff i just couldn't believe i'd never heard it i couldn't believe i'd never heard the weight you know what i mean and that's like a really fun feel such a magical song um can i run some random bands by you and just get like a quick blurb about each one (laughs) these ones I, i i have a feeling that these ones are important to you um smog and bill callahan yeah i mean that's uh um red apple falls was i was i think a junior or senior in high school when i sorry bill callahan i think i torrented it (laughs) and um it, it it's this uh it it just destroyed my entire brain because of how he wrote i mean it's still kind of something that i look to and and um probably steal from to a degree or at least when I was like getting my my footing as a trying to be a songwriter I would take a lot of the way he would his details it's just like really intense details that when written um read really well and they read really profoundly and he's been like that's a dude Bill Callahan is like my my go-to in terms of uh specifically lyrically I just and I wanted it's totally, totally. Yeah. I also I wanted to backpedal also real quick. The um, the Dan Reader thing. How did you make that connection too on the, <laughs> on on the last single? Dan Reader's on it, and I'm I'm a big Dan Reader fan too. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I so I was uh, on. I have my issues with streaming and playlisting, but um, I was on a John Prine playlist, and it just auto played a Dan Reader song, and I freaked out. I thought it was the funniest thing and also like the saddest music. And 
his voice was just out of control. So yeah. I just I researched him for a bit. Um and we did this the stranger thing. And it sort of started off as like this just me and a friend and a couple friends doing background stuff. And we had this when I did the little turntable scratch, it was kind of a joke, but it um did remind me of like trying to make a posse cut or whatever. And I do believe Dan was the first person. I just was like, fuck it. I'm just gonna email Dan Reader for you know, just to see if he would if he would respond. And um that's it was literally just that. It was probably the span of like three Amazing. Weeks where I just heard that's it so cool. Fell in love um with his music and his his voice and his uh his style and then it's just just email just cold call this is a little cold call so, so for anybody, sick for anybody out there you should just do that you should just email people now i'm obsessed with the idea though totally like, like yeah you don't get what you don't ask for you know exactly i'm obsessed with the idea of just being like oh maybe i'll just ask shania twain like maybe maybe that'll that'll happen um but yeah so that was i was just i'm so grateful he did it i mean he has such a profound verse um yeah also for the freaks out there with the music stuff, the craziest stems. He sent the most perfect stems I'd ever encountered in my life. Damn. <laughs> Completely Damn. perfect, um, succinct, precise, and ex- perfectly balanced and labeled as like left, you know, left vocal, like 42, right vocal, push it, you know, 43 or whatever. It's like, it was, it was amazing. Um, Damn. Yeah. He rolls. Um, okay, some more random names for you. Blue Nile. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, my friend, uh, uh, Nick Zenka, who uh, makes m- music under uh, Mr. Lies or did, and a uh, quiet friend, um, an amazing musician, amazing producer. He showed me um, hats, I think, the like winter of 2013 or 2014. And there's just nothing just there's just nothing crazy there's nothing more like melancholic and yeah uh, also extremely extremely like perfect production to me i've never heard anything that like sounds as weird and as cool and as cohesive as that record maybe except like voodoo in terms of the cohesion but i'm just obsessed with paul buchanan's voice and also how he writes i mean he writes in such a uniquely simple um, way that, yeah, I mean, that stuff changed my life. It's also the only music since I started making music that I dare not try to replicate in terms of like even, you know, doing a nod to it. I just don't feel like I have totally. the, the understanding of what's happening there. I don't really get how they did that record, to, to be honest with you. That's my favorite shit when it just sounds like it fell out of the sky. Oh, you know? seriously, I've never heard a record before or or you know or after that um captures exactly what that the album hats captures i mean they're totally. such a special band um i just discovered them this year myself I, and they're insane um how about tom waits <laughs> tom waits you know i am a really really um novice tom waits um person i, I i'd only ever heard uh um the Earth Died Screaming. At, at the, oh, yeah. song's amazing. It's my favorite one. <laughs> it's so sick. And I remember just being obsessed with with, with the production. And, and the, what is that? Like bones. It sounds like he's dropping bones. Yeah. a bag of bones. <laughs> That's like the, the, the mythology of the record, right? That there was actual it, yeah. just like people playing b- bones. Yeah. And like, I mean, it sounds like <laughs> full Fred Flintstone shit. Uh, what you told me once, three eleven, that Amber has the greatest snare sound of all time. Yeah, I'd never you heard. Stand that. by that. Yeah, I'd never heard it before, <laughs> and it's my favorite. It's like the most satisfying sound of whatever is going on. And you were telling me that it's like a a cat. Like what is it? Metal a piccolo piccolo snare. Is it's uh, like it's tuned? A small. Yeah, it's cranked way up. And is it just, just tuned to the really... frequency of the universe? Is that what they did? Is they... <laughs> <laughs> it's also tuned to the key of the song, which is really satisfying. It's so crazy. And so it's a note in the song, and it just feels nice to listen to. Yeah. Um, um, but with Tom Waits, just to jump back. Oh, though, sure. Uh, yeah, sorry. I will say that uh, So my girlfriend showed me that song, Old 55. 
and mm-hmm. that whole record i think it's on his first record maybe second record, i don't know but that's like um that's just i mean i'm still really obsessed trying to reach for how he it's such a simple song so like it's such a dijon song man that is yeah. such a dijon song to me <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's the it's a funny thing where it's like all those i like just have all these little shadow ideas and then you start to find things or realize that people have done them so much better and so so different also his voice just sounds insane it's very inspiring insane. To me. but um yeah, yeah. I, i'm more familiar with tom waits through his acting which mostly through oh, shortcuts that's tight. yeah oh, that's tight. It's really what weird. about june jordan oh june jordan uh, you know um yeah i think we talked about uh the i was reading like a book of um i don't really remember what the book is called but at the beginning of uh quarantine i was introduced to um to it's just this collection of sort of like um essays and poems and things like that mm-hmm and uh yeah i'm not super familiar in in to be honest with you but everything that i sort of explored briefly was very uh very moving to me but i have to how about of, yeah how about jandek <laughs> um i am uh i'm a i found out about jandek through some blog um super sick style but to me the most profound aspect of uh jandex work are his album covers to me those are the coolest they're amazing and especially like considering that he was basically anonymous for his entire career i added that to the list because i i watched a video of you playing your song violence and um Mm. and you're wearing a the the cover of like um what is it uh blue uh, one one of the Jandek classic yeah. Jandek album covers, just picture of his face. You just yeah. had the face on the shirt. Yeah, I had that shirt printed. Um, it's super inspiring to me in terms of like, you know, I there's so many things that I still haven't been able to explore. I think as a um, as a musician, and especially when you start making stuff online, you're sort of building your your arsenal or your ideas in real time. But something I've always been profoundly affected by was his uh just the nature of how he just did whatever he wanted to do and then you know sent it out and also the way everything sounds it's a huge inspiration to me um but also his covers his covers are just like i wish all my press photos just looked like that and and that was like that was, all you ever got about who he was yes yeah. you know it was just like oh well there's a picture of some person on the cover like that must be him or like there's a picture of a house it must be his house yeah, well, and I'm, I'm I was talking to uh, I was talking to a couple of friends about this. It's something I'm I'm deeply um, I'm deeply interested in, especially with like the current generation of music, where I do think we're missing that sort of um, that sort of being extremely selective about what you present and what you give. And I think it's very I think it's very inspiring. I mean, I just realized that I think you start to there's this sort of deeper like sort of homogenous feeling among a lot of music now because everything is completely accessible and everyone is completely accessible all the motivations are constantly accessible yeah look at um, us right now <laughs> yeah no but i love you know this this kind of thing is is great because it gives you an opportunity to, to like sort of exact you know have an exact conversation and that's great but i realize there's so many conversations that are kind of being had without your input through the things that you put out through like social media and stuff like that and having constant access. I think people um, occasionally will f- sort of assume things or feel a bit closer to an artist or something. Maybe that's not the best way to go. I think situations like this and like mediums like this are great because you get the exact, you get the exact, um, you get the words from, you know. Sorry, t there's a cat, <laughs> cat entering frame. <laughs> I oh. heard a rumbling sound. I know, he's petting his <laughs> and, face uh, on the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. This is cat. But um, that's yeah, Tom. Yeah, something, something about oh, Tom. Tom care. Mm-hmm. How do I turn images up on this thing? How do I turn the volume of these images up? 
Um, I know everyone's so tiny for us. Uh, <laughs> but but um, Dijon, I feel Dijon. I really hear what you're saying about um, you know, I think that having these kind of like long like there's like being present on on like social media and this kind of um, like all artists are you have access to them, but it's like this kind of like like stilted bullshit like short these little bursts or whatever so i feel like sure. in terms of being accessible i'd rather just you know just have like have a conversation or something rather than yeah um so i don't know i guess i didn't i guess i didn't mean to say like we're you're not jandek because you're on our show right now <laughs> no 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 but no i just you know, just thinking about Jandek is just something that's always been in the back of my mind is this sort of like eventual uh, desire to be able to sort of recede. And you know, sometimes you just feel like you have to kind of exist in a very um, sort of constant and, but also temporary way all the time. And that's just something I always think about. It's like with Jandek, it's like, oh, how rad. You could just make records and send one photo of yourself ever to it. Um, to a place until you're ready to do the next thing. Um, and I've always liked that. This music is f pretty fucking far out. <laughs> I don't know, it's a little out for me sometimes, but really crazy sounds. Um, and cool hat, the guy had. Oh yeah. Yeah, when he finally, when he finally like, you know, made his, played a show and was like, here I am. Yeah. Just like this kind of like old guy in a cowboy hat. In a, in a little cap. I love his all black outfit situation too. That's really, it's, I don't know. I still like cool stuff. You know, I'm like a, I'm a guy who likes cool stuff. So, <laughs> Jandex like yeah. cool. He's like a cool guy. Dude, I love speaking cool of, stuff. Speaking <laughs> of cool, the the birth of cool. Um, you you have said that everyone should just stop what they're doing and only listen to miles davis <laughs> i was extremely drunk and <laughs> i was um at a at a a bar in montana and they were playing it actually had nothing to do with miles davis when i was feeling this but i was listening to like they were just playing i think they were playing like jerry jeff walker and it was mostly like a self-flagellation thing where i was like it's so crazy to me that I can make music and I'm just not this good at like, I just <laughs> didn't, I did not study to the, to the, you know, the nth degree, the way that these people did, the way they play is just so tight. And so I just thought about Miles Davis too, because thoughts are just running in my head of people who were like actually profoundly good. And mm -hmm. I mean, obviously I, I don't adhere to this rule. I actually think it's a silly thing. I think you should be full of contradictions, but mm -hmm. um, at, the, at that moment I was extremely moved by the idea that Miles Davis and, Sherry Jeff Walker and um, a lot of these other musicians I might have invoked were just really good at what they did. They were really tight players. Um, but yeah, screw all that. Miles Davis, doobop. <laughs> Even for his his time, though, Miles Miles wasn't like a shredder on trumpet. Yeah. You know, he yeah. was he was more m minimal than most most of the like hard bop guys of um, of his time. 100%. Which, uh, so in some ways, he he, you guys might be kind of similar in that in that regard. Um, an anime guy, you know. <clears throat> I've had my I've had my flirtations with anime because um, I I noticed you have it running in the background at at your studio sometimes. <laughs> yeah, um, they're just I get these little. Uh, flights of um sometimes it's got to be like nature or sometimes mm -hmm. it has to be something really colorful um but mm -hmm. i grew up more into uh like the, you know anime films i wasn't necessarily i couldn't talk shop with anybody about like series really except like cowboy bebop and flc all the stuff that we had like pretty re ready access to but i was really like deep into the the more motion, the, the film stuff. So like, you know, like Perfect Blue and and mm -hmm. um, like Ghost in the Shell. I'm always just, I just like, I'm just, very, it's very evocative stuff to me. But I'm not the deepest head with with anime, to be honest with you. Me neither. I have a love it, hate thing with it. I, I think 
it's it's really bad a lot of the time. But FLCL does exactly what I want. And Cowboy Bebop. I wrote down just Cowboy Bebop question mark. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because oh, you deeply. had that run in like every time I went over to your space. <laughs> yeah, no, deeply, deeply influential in terms of just like the tone of what I like in things. Um, yeah. It just has this, it's like this weird constant poem. It's like this, it's this weird It's beautiful poem. and yeah. melancholy. It's, I mean, yeah. it makes and sense it, to me. So it's just, yeah, I always just try to compile things that I find exactly the same, which is completely different. Um, in their execution, but like they make me feel exactly the same way. And Cowboy Bebop is a huge, it's just a mood thing for me. It's like very, um, yeah, it's very, very beautiful and very melancholy. You said it, you said it right. I cool. Are you, and, it's, and it's sci-fi. Yes, yeah, super sci-fi. I love that kind of stuff. That's like the world building of, of, of um, things like that where it's something I try to do when I write a lot, which is, sort of create a space in my brain and then only have the action taking place as if you're already aware of the space and aware of the mm-hmm. history. It's something I'm very obsessed with writing. And Cowboy Bebop does that amazingly, where you kind of get little snatches of why the world's like that, but not really. They just, they're just people in that world. Um, totally. And that's a huge influence to me. Yeah, it's still pretty character-driven, the mm-hmm. show. Wow. But the aesthetic is so, so, so good. But it, it yeah. doesn't just lean on that. Um, Cole, imagine if you played Chalice on Zero game one there, huh? Then I did. And they, they, and they, then bounced, they bounced it. it. <laughs> I wanted to be safe, so I wanted to play another Chalice on Zero. But it got countered by my Chalice that was already on Zero. So it's just... Adam was, told you not to get Restore Balanced, and you didn't listen. I can't see, I can't see the chat. <laughs> What form um, is this? This is, this is modern. It's one of the more esoteric, like just it's so inbred and just you can lose on game one, on turn one. It's just it's such what? a stupid way to play magic. But like, what, it does, but like, often doesn't a, feel like a game. <laughs> this is like a website. What what is the spreadsheet situation? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. They call it the spreadsheet, man. It's it looks... it's it's the older version of Arena. It's like twenty years old. Oh wow! But there are still these fucking boomers who won't let it go. So and sick. we're we're one of them. <laughs> the, the the nice thing about using this over Arena is we can play any deck. So sure. if we want to like get real weird with the cards, if you want to um, like full rat deck, exactly. <laughs> That's an option. Um, but uh, it's just a such a silly way. Someone wants us. Someone in chat wants us to play commander. Um, I don't even know how. Also, uh, this is an interesting question. I've heard you rant about this before, Dijon. Uh, you ever feel like LA sucks inspiration out of you? You know. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's such a weird double-edged, uh, what do you call that, a double-edged uh, sword? <laughs> um, it's like really weird because, I, yeah, well, it, it's just so interesting to me because being the katana that it is, it's like I get to meet people that I just would have never met, like, you know, meeting you guys and I get inspiration in that way, meeting friends and other musicians who challenge me. Um to always like try to keep going but at the same time that, that sort of you know being so adjacent to like this industry situation sort of negates that feeling for me sometimes because i'm like mm-hmm. this this constant competitiveness not among peers but among like a giant claw that this immovable thing and it just occasionally makes me feel a bit a bit loopy in terms of my motivations, you know, I'm constantly being offset by meeting cool people and trying new things and then feeling completely demotiv- demotivated by like the really furious nature of it. You know, it's so fast paced and the expectations are pretty intense and you're constantly being um, confronted with your job all the time, which freaks yeah, me. What is your identity? Yeah. Your identity is just, and I feel, I noticed that in LA when I first moved here, I bought like a bookshelf on Craigslist and the first thing the guy said was what his job was. Yeah, a hundred percent. And that can just get a little exhausting for me. I mean, it's so beautiful and, and, and 
pretty rich in terms of the you know the um, the cool stuff that that you can run into here but yeah i just get a little drained by being constantly confronted by my job which then makes me think about my you know my duties which i don't want to think about all the time and um yeah i don't like walking around thinking i'm like a music guy but i do think that when i'm here which kind of freaks me out so you just need to move to pasadena or like sierra madre and then you won't feel that way i think it's so dang pricey it is parts are expensive cole's out in pasadena for a reasonable price so you just got to know where to look well i would just build a big box and grow tomatoes um yeah that sounds tight tomatoes (laughs) and grapes can i grow Um, grapes here yeah, not in Pasadena because have you, of the peacocks. Have, that's oh. true. Haven't you been up north on all the uh, the the vineyards? I, you know, I've driven through the Salinas Valley. Is that what they call it? Never what is it up there? there? We played. Cole, <laughs> we played at a winery up there, didn't we? On, yeah, <laughs> that was strange. That's um, sick. I feel like you're kind of in. A metamorphosis you're going through metamorphosis right now creatively you seem really inspired to me and you seem like you're discovering new things you're really excited about trying approaching music in in new ways um do you feel like you're going through a metamorphosis because i feel like you're going through i feel like you're, you're yeah becoming i mean a butterfly <laughs> I'm becoming a young butterfly with <laughs> the head of a a door. Um, uh, no, I really do. I mean, I think that um, the biggest the biggest change for me was, you know, I think a lot of the ideas that I had when I first started making music were really shrouded in a deep insecurity, right? So I made a lot of music as like a like relative to other music. So um, there was always this guardedness that, that happened. And then when I started like opening up to in the last like year or so and opening up to like collaboration and all these things, it, it just sort of felt like it freed my brain to make way more mistakes. And starting to realize that like I sort of superficially for a while introduced the idea of like mistakes in my music but everything was pretty intensely crafted like the lo-fi nature of the whole thing it's like i would do that um it was always a sort of this retaliation against something but now Mm. it's like you know opening up with friends and and um allowing more people to sort of influence the music directly has just allowed me to i think rethink what I was trying to do. Um, I would always labor sometimes over lyrics and um, I still do to a degree, but I allow my, like, I'm starting to trust myself with having like a little set of themes and ideas and vocabulary pieces that I like and then allowing them to come out in ways that are less, you know, structured and less, um, sometimes less coherent. And it's just, I think, made me more excited to make music. So I'd say, yeah, it's a hundred percent right. I think I'm in a deep transition period. I mean, for the first time ever, I'm just like making music that I really, really want to hear in a way that doesn't have this sort of like um, this sort of defense. Uh, like a lot of the music that I'm working on right now is completely vulnerable to a degree that's not necessarily emotional. It's like <laughs> it's like vulnerable in, in that oh man, this might really suck or mm-hmm. this might not be really great. And I just never allowed myself to make those sort of mistakes before. I think working on this record. Um, you know, there's probably like 30 pieces of music so far, maybe. And before, I would only ever release what I had, which is typically like five things ever, because mm-hmm. I didn't want to make any mistakes. I didn't want to have a hard drive that had like poop on it. You know what I mean? And, mm-hmm. you know, in working on a, this newer music, I'm more excited to have these um, mistakes, which is allowing me to be a little bit more motivated and excited about the sort of experiments that you can kind of get into. Um, I always fancied myself a person who was really into like experimental ideas, but rarely gave myself a chance to do them um, because I was always so self-conscious about how a 
the structure of a song should be or something like that. I wanted to prove something to somebody. I don't, I don't know mm-hmm. necessarily who it was. But yeah, so I do think it's kind of changing. I mean, maybe for, I think for the better, but maybe the music will be worse. Who knows? <laughs> There's, you said that the, the lo fi ness was sort of a retaliation against something. What do you mean by that? Yeah, uh, my, um, I mean, I could, I could bore you both with, all of the, the brain thoughts that I've always had, but my, my my first nature, at least melodically and harmonically, was always um, very R and B influenced, and pretty much always R and B. Like the way I approach things is is that way. So I just got really, as I was like working on songwriting and writing songs for the first time in that way, for like a lot of the earlier music I released, I just hated the idea of. R&B is this um, cool thing, like sexy. It was like you had to be constantly categorized as like smooth or vibey. Um, so I wanted to just make it sound really bad. And I also don't have the biggest knowledge of like EQing and mixing and recording, but I just wanted to lean into that pretty heavily because I thought it would disrupt, at least for me, what that kind of approach melodically could actually sound like um that was like always my mission statement was to try to make it and then you start to realize that oops if you just open up your ears and your eyes everybody's doing that but i i really thought well, that i i was like the only one who was like blowing out the vocals and stuff you know? no for any for anyone who's ever seen you live i think that's that's definitely one of the most striking things about when you perform the songs especially there's that there's a rawness to it, a vulnerability, and an aggression that you don't normally hear in R&B music um, that I think is exciting. Yeah, and I think that I, fa- I, I, well, I appreciate that. I, I think I did fail a lot of times at properly translating that, but that's what I always wanted to do in like, working with Jack and Henry, especially mm-hmm. live. Um, allowed it to, like, you sort of, you know, we workshopped a couple of ways to make the music. And mm-hmm. when, you re- when we realized that as a three-piece or something, you strip everything down, it leaves you right in the center. And I really disliked the idea of playing live initially, so I wanted it to be this kind of constant crucifixion, if you will. Mm-hmm. And it allowed me to like get that style a little bit more. Like I realized, like okay, this is what was kind of latent in all my music, but now that there's not really much supporting except like you know the chords and really minimal drums, you kind of have to give something extra and something new. I just thought it was also so lame how often I would see people who I can't sing that well, so I'm not like a <laughs> not, yeah, right. yeah. No, but I'm not like shut a, the fuck up. No, but not you know I'm not like a crooner. With these, with these, with these <laughs> there's some really amazing crooners out there, and I always just thought it was like you know. Is that the pinnacle of uh, like either you're you're a good singer and you're a crooner, or and then there's everybody else? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, like I just think that sometimes when I'm in this space and like you see my peers. I'm competing against some really amazing like vocalists, like yeah, like getting. I don't have much right. control over my shit, so mm. um, I wanted to lean into it being a little bit more like the only good shows I'd ever saw growing up were like I would go to house shows or um, in college, and you know we had this place in Baltimore called the Bell Foundry, and I saw this like really crazy punk set from a, a, a band called Mishka, and. I was so just inspired by that and I was like wow how can you do that but like you know with songs that you have or songs that maybe are a little you know more gentle how do you bridge that gap because I thought it was the most electrifying thing to see it was mm-hmm. um, really aggressive uh, performance I just think that there also should be a confrontation between the performer and the audience personally yeah I personally totally agree. Uh, that's my philosophy I, I, I think that it's a beautiful thing to have people see you play, but you can, it can be mutually exclusive. I think there's also this like strange voyeurism too, especially when you make songs that are, you know, super intimate, right? I think that there's this sort of, you start to parrot emotions if you don't, um, it's like you're kind of pantomiming. And I think people mm-hmm. sometimes want you to pantomime. Um, so I just always wanted to confront people who had the, who were uh, kind enough to buy tickets. I wanted to confront the uh, the feeling that I was feeling, which is like, well, you know, I'm singing some pretty sad stuff that I think made me pretty sad when I did it. 
and I don't want you to see like it's not it doesn't feel right to sort of pretend as if I'm singing it I'm not like like I'm singing it for the 50th time or something like have the emotions be sort of diluted in that way so I've always wanted to confirm you know I, I want to confront the audience to a degree without being like Gallagher remember Gallagher who smashes watermelon um <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to go as far as I can without smashing a watermelon. Um, and now that I've played more shows, I, I'm really excited to continue poking at the bear. So, you, mm -hmm. you know, if you will. Yeah, I, I think there's something about watching someone kind of unhinged and come undone as what, you know, in, in a genuine way that doesn't feel contrived. Um, yeah. And, um, uh, and I, and yeah, I, also, I also think it's true that like, you know, when you're performing your songs, like no matter what the intention was when you made the song or what it's about, like it doesn't necessarily mean that to the audience. So like they like you kind of lose once you finish a song, you kind of lose control over it. And it's like, sure, I think it's in a way no longer. I mean, it's still yours, but like you lose a piece of it. You know, I think it's like a yeah. interesting discussion that that comes up when like, you know, filmmakers will like do a director's cut of their thing and it's like, well, this movie's been out forever. Like you kind of it kind of belongs to us now because it's been out in the public for so long and I I kind of feel that way with with music. I like it there is this kind of it it feels voyeuristic when they're like seeing this like insight into your song, but like also, you know, they're they have their own connections to it as well. Yeah, I think I, I totally agree. And I, I'm, I think also there's this like exciting element, right? Where since it is sort of, you're sort of, you know, relinquishing control over, over your music when you play it live. Um, it's nice to me, the idea that you can kind of disrupt the form constantly if you want to. And that's something I've been very obsessed with since I was able to see like, um, you know, the, I think the first band I ever watched was uh, Phosphorescent Live. And mm. just knowing how, like, he had that song Wolves that was really big, but seeing how he did it live, where it's like, it's the same song, but, you know, it's degraded and, and sort of mutated to a degree that, like, that's my other experience with that song. Like, I have the record version, I have another experience that I remember. And I think that that's kind of an exciting thing if you're going to, have to relinquish control to at least constantly reshape it. You know, I, I think that I have a lot of criticisms of specifically with like R and B performing. It can become so easy to just like have it just be really good all the time. Um, never inspired by by like really perfect um, performances. So I think that if you can make a song that people might like have a different color, that's very exciting to me. Um, I also think that you know D'Angelo, who's who's you know one of the yeah. the figureheads of the genre, yeah. had a really raw, lo-fi sound to yeah. his shit. You know, yeah. it, it wasn't. I mean, he, he was obviously like an impeccable vocalist. Yeah. To put it lightly, but there was such a looseness to those recordings in oh. in so many different ways that. Oh. Yeah. Um, and I think you 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 kind of um, are doing that in a different way that I think is really interesting and cool. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate that. I mean, yeah, I think it's just I don't mention voodoo often because I just kind of feel like it's like fairly obvious. You know, what I mean, like that's like the mm -hmm. best album ever made in my opinion. Right. And right. and um, it's like almost like yeah, it's like okay, the sun's out. Right? That makes sense. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, even I mean, even his performances live from what I've seen, I've never seen him live, but even he like gets quite um, exciting and sort of anti the record to a degree, which is also really cool. But mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, the way he recorded, I could begin to count the ways that just that entire approach has just informed everything in my life, not even the music, just like how I walk down a street. It's like <laughs> it's, I got I got a voodoo bounce sometimes when I walk. Um, I know what you mean. But yeah, I mean, it's all super sick. That you can never understand a damn word he's saying. It's like really exciting to me. Um, yeah, we could just talk about voodoo tonight. But even yeah. uh, even with all the like 
the looseness you incorporate and the there's kind of you're you're the from what I've heard of what of your new stuff, you're kind of going even more lo fi at times. Yeah. But I was wondering if you had just infinite means to make any record, just all the money in the world, biggest studio in the world. Um, how much would that change what you're doing? And it's kind of a pointless hypothetical because no, it's an don't. interesting. But I think for lo-fi artists, it's, it's kind of how much of it is shaped by your environment and your circumstances and how much of it is like, genu- you know, your limitations almost. And then how much of it is, th- no, this is this is the aesthetic I would go with even if I had all the options in the world. Yeah, um, I think that it's, it's an interesting question. Um, something I think about all the time. I mean, you were there when, you know, we were working on some stuff and, you, you know, we worked on some stuff together and I find it, that that approach that sort of like of just being in the room um, and sort of having to work with the circumstances, I just personally wouldn't change that because I do at this point, I don't think of as a crutch, but I do think it informs the music. And I think especially with the newer stuff, it's part of the, it's like a character on the, mm-hmm. the, the thing. I, there's just nothing that turns me off more than the idea of like not being able to cut my own vocal when I get excited, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, nothing. Are you really hands on? Yeah, like, but studio. nothing freaks me out more than the idea of having to like tell somebody like, okay, let's do that again. I'm just, I, everything has to be really fast, and I just mm-hmm. also don't like. Personally, I'm just like not really into the idea of like treated rooms all the time. I don't, I don't mm-hmm. like that sound. I don't like. Um, um, yeah, I kind of just like the character of whatever space you're in, really fucking with the recording and making it really hard to mix. <laughs> that's that's something that I'm. I just think that there's got to be a new, you know. I don't know. That's just, I don't know. I like that kind of thing. I just think there's also, you know, when you step into a studio, as I'm sure you both know, there's this weight that exists just automatically. The, mm-hmm. the space, the space has a character and it's the character typically for me has always been very intimidating and very uh, foreboding. I don't like it. You um, feel kind of like pressures on when you walk into a legit studio. Yeah. I just like, there's not, a, I would never trade having like a pretty shitty setup, even though like, you know, you can improve and, and get better and get better equipment and a better knowledge of how you're doing things. But I wouldn't trade. There's that. also this, like, I feel like in my life, I'm kind of always trying to escape the like capitalist idea that my time is worth money. Yes. You know, it's like, I feel like at, at the beginning of the pandemic, when it was like thinking about, you know, how should we spend our time? And, and like, I just felt like I had to resist so hard to like the urge to be productive, you know? Um, And I think that there's something really liberating about just kind of spending your time doing what, what interests you and and whatever. But um, I feel like being in a recording studio foregrounds that so much because it's not just like if you don't do stuff, you're, you know, losing money. It's like the, the time it's like $700 a day or whatever it costs. Yeah. And that yeah. just is like the opposite of it's not conducive to creativity at all. So yeah. true. A hundred percent. I mean, I've also just never had a relationship with music enough where like I'm confident to walk in with like an idea of what I want a song to already sort of be like. I have like for me the process of making, especially with the newer stuff, um, it's so ingrained like it it's so integrated with just like building the song in real time. I, I could never step in the studio knowing that I'm like, yeah, losing money and then not having an idea. I would just never have an idea. I, I couldn't go in there. Even if I had a finished song, I would never know, you know, how to make that time effective. It's, you just got to sit with the music for me. That's my whole thing is just sitting with it and building it, um, just building it constantly, constantly shaping it live. I think that's the biggest experiment that I'm working with on this the newer stuff is uh, the songs are typically all of them to a degree were being written in the room. And yeah, I can't imagine. I can't imagine doing it another way now, which is probably a huge Achilles heel. probably. But um, yeah, no, you're con- you're constantly I was watching a Philip Glass interview last night and he was saying how finding your voice isn't the problem. It's that once you find it, you have to learn how to get rid of it after that. Yeah. Um, uh, cause otherwise you're just doing an impression of yourself for the rest of your life. Um, and I feel like you're, you're kind of in a, in one of your get rid of it phases and, and reapproaching things. Um, yeah. Is there a song that you have out 
that is um that surprised you the most like it it was not what you set out to make and has and just the the thing that it ended up being was super different from where you started yeah i mean <clears throat> i would say like rock and roll you know started off as a sort of a, a gag you know the whole thing was sort of a, a goof around and um i mean to the credit of jack and henry it got completely reshaped into this mutant Jack and song. Henry being your producers yeah. and uh, yeah, live the, uh, band. Live band, yeah. Um, very close friends. Um, I'm actually a Jack. Shout house. out Quap. Shout out to Quap Quap. Um, Where did the name Fern come from? Quick, quick, uh, <laughs> quick, you know, set, uh, divergence. I have um, no idea. That was all. Really strong. <laughs> Fern Quapis is incredibly strong. It's a beautiful, it's like a beautiful name. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, no, the rock and roll just got mutated to a crazy degree that when you, if you hear like the, the voicemail demo of like me fucking around on that riff, because I, I, it's sort of a joke because I'd never really heard, you know, like riffs. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not familiar with riffs. So it was like the whole was me being like, look, I did a riff. And yeah. um, then it got shaped into a very confident, I think you know, sort of perverse uh, reinterpretation of, of pop music that I was really excited about. So Yeah, song leaves an impression, for sure. It's, re it's really intense, you know. But, yeah, so that one's really exciting um, in terms of it's... Most of the stuff I've also done, though, to be honest, until I started working with Jack and Henry, most of the stuff was just exactly how the, the demos were. Um, mm -hmm. I never had, like, demos. I mean, I guess all my stuff was demos. Um, so I would always just release them exactly as they were on the hard drive. So I'd say anything that's kind of dropped now, even The Stranger was just, it was such a crazy, funny idea that I had like had. And then like, you know, me, Jack and Henry and all the people who were involved built into like an actual song that I thought was very sweet and very heartwarming to me. It felt like Christmas music. Um, it's, it's so insane to me that you say all your songs are demos. I know what you mean when you're saying that because you kind of, there was no like, oh, here's the first draft. And then I went into a nicer studio, you know, yeah. and did it for real. But, you know, if you heard Cole and I's demos, you know, <laughs> and if we were to make albums out of some of the shit that, <laughs> that are demos, you know, it's such a different, such a different thing. Well, um, you know, what is I'm sure your guys' um, relationship to writing songs is so different, you know, to to mine. Where definitely, I am um, still, try, you know, I feel like you guys have more of a an acumen and probably a focus. I'm just so unfocused with with music that when I say demo too, it's kind of like being a bit generous. It's of course like I would recut a vocal until it was good. Totally, but I, ne totally. I never had like yeah, I never had like any. Or it's because I never had an idea that I could ever finish a song later, you know. Um, so I don't know. I think that that's a different approach. Like I didn't have the confidence, still don't have the confidence necessarily to go back to music. Um, I'm learning to do that, but because I, I think I throw away a lot of ideas. But I feel like if you approach music with, you know, an understanding that you can have the capability to make it a little bit better, that's probably a stronger thing. If your demos are like, well, we can just make this into like a you know, you can have an idea to how to shape it later. It's probably a stronger skill set. Mine is just like, get it out, get the whole idea out, or else you'll never make music again. But it's a very I don't know, you know, man. <laughs> it's all it's all just different different approaches, right? Yeah. I, there's like, you know, Bob Dylan who just writes his most iconic songs in ten minutes, or there's <laughs> Leonard Cohen who takes years to write Hallelujah, you know. Yeah. It's just they're both you can't it's just it, it is what it is i think yeah. yeah that's the beauty of it also grass isn't mm -hmm. always greener is it yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> totally totally no i i love watching your whole procedure i think it's it's um there's a freedom to it and there's a contagiousness to that freedom in the room everyone's ideas are welcome i think that's such a great way to make music and and it translates into the songs. I think people can hear that. Well, I appreciate it. I mean, it, it's completely contingent on 
I realized like that it's something I'm really trying to work on and it's just contingent on other people for me. It's like letting the project be a project after, you know, suddenly. Um, and then having the, the sort of confidence in myself to be like, hey, if you didn't play 90% of the stuff on here, that's okay. And that's a huge like transformation for me where I was so obsessed with being like, you know, the one guy, the one guy, even though I was just not good at any instrument, I was like, I'm going to do it all. Like, um, you know, and, and I just think that it's just been so, so, ben so much more beneficial to just have ideas from people and like have that trust thing. It makes you also just like look at music in a more fun. I was, I had a very bad, I think, relationship with music for, for some time. It was very, um, it, it just was, was pretty, pretty just toxic to me and i just think that having friends and like you know you know uh you guys coming over and things like that and just like trying it's just the stakes become simultaneously extremely high and low like there's just no yeah no judgment and it, it lets me feel a little bit more confident too and i think that that's very helpful for me so, well i'm judging you the whole time there yeah no like, but, well, i heard yeah. about that <laughs> i saw yeah. the ledger that you had yeah was like three missed notes pitchy but, well <laughs> but i i think there's that, that's such a common misconception in music like phoebe who i think we're having on next week is is someone you know she's a solo artist phoebe bridgers you know but there's so many people in the room contributing sure. to that stuff you know yeah. and it is such it takes a village um and i think that my fa my favorite stuff is always when when it, there's that one and one is three of people collaborate, you know, greater than the sum of your parts kind of thing. Yeah. Um, that's those. That's always the music that gets me super excited. Brian's calling me. <laughs> Brian says I'm judgy AF. Everyone <laughs> know. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, no, but it's it's such a it's such a new thing for me where it's like oh yeah like you can't do it all and like some of the best ideas come from just. You know the, the 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 accidents and allowing people to feel so free that um yeah i also think that you know on some headier f philosophical shit i think especially Go with, off <laughs> no, not it's not really but um i think that i'm not super unaware of where my music typically slots for people and that's okay um to be categorized it's just it's just natural but when you notice that a lot of the stuff that you know exists in that space is very much like producer songwriter like boom there's something so exciting to me about like knowing that you'll be sort of dancing in that world with people but you have like a bunch of friends that you brought along where there isn't some sort of binary uh system here about like how the music was made mm -hmm. you know it's very much mm -hmm. like you know this was played here and then i also played a version of that and somebody else wrote this change it's like i feel like that's so new um to a degree like approaching it like a band to, to in, in but with computers or like, think, like the band yeah you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i mean that's such an exciting thing for me is like seeing how some some of my tendencies which are specifically you know very R&B can like feel when it's like other people helping and other people contributing in a way that's not black and white, you know, like production here and, or, or whatever. It's like if everybody's playing stuff, what a cool sound that can be. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I totally agree with that. I, I think it adds a lot. Um, I have a, uh, I have a hypothetical for you. Um, this is a uh, this is I think I think that this could be this could be a film. This could, could be this could be a lot of different things. Um, so I just have a science fiction hypothetical for you. If uh, if you could clone yourself with <laughs> the caveat that the clone of yourself is is wildly attracted to you and it just can't be around you because your your clone just like is too in love with you um would you uh 
allow yourself to be seduced by yourself in order to, you know, reap reap the benefits of having double the Dijon. Oh my God! You can't. I think... You can't have it. You it's either you, you're seduced by yourself and <laughs> and you're together now, or there's no clone. There's no in between. No clone. Not a chance. If I yeah. ever had to look, because the clone in my head would wear the same clothes that I'd be wearing every time I changed my clothes, or they would also change. <laughs> yeah, of course. There's not, yeah, there's not a chance. That's how Dude, it works. That's, that's the biggest caveat is the is for me is the ch- the clothes. I don't know. No, I, I would kill the clone. I would shoot the clone immediately from distance. <laughs> and, I feel like the movie from a distance. I feel like the movie writes itself. I feel like it's yeah. there. Cole's not super well, high on the idea, but I think it's strong. Yeah. Well, the movie would end to me 30 to pretty, 40 minutes. Pretty early on. <laughs> yeah, super early. You'd have a lot well, of like. I think you would start to fall for yourself. And you then, think so? And then quickly, quickly realize that you're you're going down the wrong. I'm, I'm you know, projecting. You know, it would be sick, though. Doing harmonies way faster. Because you have a clone. <laughs> True. The third, get the third. Imagine, imagine the sickest vibe of just a barbershop quartet of the same cat. Just like, <laughs> yeah, like the Elliot you, Smith, you, like a uh, um, because cover where it's just like 500 layers of himself and it's beautiful. Easy. Imagine if you could just rock that on the street. Just because you would have the same tone. You know what I mean? And you would know exactly how you'd want to hit that. No, without having to tell them. Yeah, never mind. I'm taking the clone. I'll take two of them. Hey, I know that <laughs> yeah. card. Damn. I'm trying to zoom in, but I know this card up top. Your target card? opponent. Target opponent. Uh. Oh, duress. Duress. That's what that's called. If if see, we forgot to mention this, but if thought sees, which our podcast or podcast, which our our show is named after, ever gets uh, cast against us, we owe you five dollars. But oh. it wasn't cast against us, so. That's like a thing we're trying out. I don't know if it'll stick. So I'm honestly shocked there hasn't been one cast this game. I know, because this deck is supposed to be the Thoughtseize deck. But this... you're just shit out of luck. Oh, I was looking at the swamp. Let's go, and I was like, what is that? Oh, this y'all, is swamp? Um, y'all are watching random. it from the from the Twitch stream. You, you guys are behind, man. We're we're just... Do you, do you want to like a, just a little update before we close about how we performed in this Magic League? Oh please! Really know. poorly. Are you talking? <laughs> really <laughs> poorly. <laughs> yeah, I actually can't remember. I think you only won one game. No, it's not not true. We got to watch it back. I mean, Maybe one match. Stupid. Oh, one so you're match. This, this sci-fi deck just didn't didn't pull its weight. It it didn't. No, it didn't. It's terrible. It's terrible, and I and I hate it personally. But I'm, <laughs> you know. I think we just need to get more creative and, and go on arena. You just you know, gotta know your enemy. You know, it's important to 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 um to just like you know you keep your friends close, your enemies closer, or whatever. Yeah, well, the enemy of my enemy is my best friend. I heard that. Um, <laughs> I heard that said by Randy Newman. The man, the myth, the legend. I um, with Randy Newman so. He's so incredible. He's so insane, that guy. Did you go with Hank to to Hollywood Bowl to see him play? No, I didn't know. Hank went and was telling me about it, and I was super jealous. Before we wrap up, how did you get connected with with Henry and Jack? My manager is Henry's first cousin. And a couple years ago, we just like... I first moved to LA, or I guess a couple of years after I moved to LA, did a session, hung out. Um, then I was working on some demos for this thing I dropped called Sci Fi. And we ended up sort of working together to try to see if we could make that into like a proper record. And ever since then, we just, you know, we just really connected deeply. Um, talented so boys. Talk. The most talented in the world, I think. And Jack so, with the coming in hot with the visuals too. I yeah, I, I don't even get it. It's very nuts. 
Growing stuff, up with those guys sucked, man. <laughs> it's just like you I'd be in bands and then they'd be in cooler bands and I'd just be like, sure. fuck you guys. I just can't <laughs> Oh hey, this before we terrible. before we uh get I I one thing I was thinking we could do on this thing is ask our opponent what kind of music they like, you know? Ask them what oh, they're yeah. listening to. So they, our opponent played like a like a a black deck. Uh, very mm-hmm. very metal, and I said, "What kind of music do you listen to?" Just wondering. They said, "I was hoping to draw land here." Um, well, well, anyway, they're listening to uh, <laughs> they're listening to metal, and I said, "What metal. kind? What what kind of metal?" And they said, "They're listening to nerd metal, Symphony <gasps> X." Whoa, what's that? I do don't we, know. Do we know what that is? I don't know. Ask Ask Carrie and G. <laughs> yeah. We'll we have should... to ask. We'll have to ask when we have our metal buds on. I'm guessing you it guys... sucks. You guys want to be in a mayhem cover band with me? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And tonight. We name it after the magic card Mayhem Devil. Whoa. Or duress. One. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> I I think one thing um, Luke, something Lucas and I have talked about, like we've talked about it ad nauseum. Is how many? Well, that's a magic card. Anyway, whatever. The, <laughs> we've talked forever about um, uh, magic cards that have inc- that would be great band names, and mm-hmm. we we actually were racing to see who could uh, name a song after a magic card first. And actually, we both lost to Wild Nothing, who had a song called Sleight of Hand. Ah, well, I mean, really. Specifically, know you know, it's also a an, a phrase. You, you're not right. out of the you're not you're not out of the race. Is, is what I'm, my point. They're mostly. I still phrases. haven't gotten to use sacrifice outlet. So, yeah, but that's not a card. No. You should name a song "Bloodthirsty Aerialist." And there's no... <laughs> oh yeah, that's Dijon's card. That's, that's my card. That's his pet card. <laughs> we should have played that. <laughs> yeah, we should have. He so he's mono black. Aggro is is Dijon's vibe. So the opposite of uh, what we've just uh, yeah just we played. just played what? blue trash, just like garbage. <laughs> yeah, it's literal garbage. We really missed uh, this time, but we're 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 working out the we're work, working out the Jeez. the uh, the the deck vibes here. We're we're getting it together. Yeah, we got um, we got a we got a good one for for Phoebe if uh, she ever returns your phone call. <laughs> Oops. All right. Well, thank you for coming on, Dijon. Thank you guys you so rule, much, man. man. Yeah, uh, Dijon, it was amazing to to hear your thoughts on on stuff. I knew you'd have some big ideas, and and you definitely yeah. did. It was really cool you to hear. Came through. Yeah. Well, thank um, you um, thanks that. to everyone for hanging out. Um, thanks to Deranged Strangler for the original music, and that's all we got for today. Let's uh, sign us out, Cole. All right. Here we go. Here's our. Oh, hold on. <laughs> Oh God! <laughs> I can't reach the mouse. The cat. The cat's here. All right. Okay. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thanks, Dijon. Thank you. Guys.